We're beginning a new series today called Christmas at the Movies. Each week, we will take a look at a classic Christmas movie and highlight one point, one main thought, and drill down and find a spiritual life lesson we can all learn and apply. We're beginning the series with the first movie, The Polar Express. And here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to learn. At some point in all of our lives, we will have to experience God for ourselves. We must arrive at a place in the journey of life where we pause long enough to confront God, to look Him in the face, to scream into the silence and say, I will not let you go until you reveal yourself to me. So grab a Bible, a phone, a notepad, and let's jump into part one of Christmas at the Movies. Now before we do, what is the mission of Forest Park Church? Our mission is simple and everything we do here at Forest Park centers around our mission. Our mission reads, help others follow Jesus one step at a time. All right, let's jump into part one of Christmas at the Movies. On Christmas Eve many years ago, I lay quietly in my bed. I did not rustle the sheets. I breathed slowly and silently. I was listening for a sound, a sound I was afraid I'd never hear. Why to the North Pole, of course. This is the Polar Express! I'm not sure another child believed in Santa Claus more than me. I was all in. From mailing letters to the North Pole, to making reindeer food, to leaving chocolate cookies and milk and even a bologna sandwich or two. I remember well waking up close to midnight and hearing noises come from the living room. Convinced Santa was delivering my toys, I refused to peek for I feared startling him. I closed my eyes, praying I'd go back to sleep. I love Santa Claus, and I believe somehow, some way, with his magic, he was able to get into my little mobile home and unload my presence. I believed until I didn't anymore. I remember sitting in the back seat of a 1972 Oldsmobile, staring out the window as my parents were driving, when everything began to unravel for me. I asked questions no kid wanting to hold on to the magic of Santa is permitted to ask. I probed and investigated. I put my mother on the witness stand. Eventually, she cracked. My inquisitive mind forced her to lift the curtain, expose the conspiracy. I sat there for a few seconds trying to wrap my mind um, around existing in a world absent of the magic of Christmas. I felt betrayed, lied to, hurt as if a thief had slipped into my little world of sleigh bells, red velvet suits, fluffy white beards, and a universal naughty list and sucked the magic out of the air. I found myself living in a non-enchanted world for the first time. For a kid whose world was mostly gray, the color of Christmas was a highlight of my year, and now those colors were muted and everything was awash with dullness. I remember experiencing a sense of displeasure, 
it hung over me for a few days. I didn't want to live in a Santa-free world, colorless, bland. My four-dimensional world filled with flying reindeer and time-warping elves and magical workshops in the North Pole became a two-dimensional, flat, predictable, boring world. And I wasn't ready. But there I was. I'm not sure another young man believed in God more than me. I was all in. From the time I was a little kid, God was in the air. He was in the air I breathed, and he dripped through every pore of my being. Sunday school, VBS, revivals, choirs, prayer meetings, Wednesday night Bible studies, and Sunday evening services. I prayed every night before sleep and over every meal. Determined to change the world for God by converting as many people as possible. Eventually, I enrolled in Bible college and then seminary. God was everything. Until he wasn't. I begin asking questions no one wanting a peaceful, undisturbed faith is permitted to ask. And at a point I cannot locate, something slipped. Everything shifted. What I thought was an unending well of sparkling faith turned out to be a stale, shallow basin of recycled assumptions. Again, at a much deeper and far more profound level, all the magic was sucked out of my universe. Rather than a four-dimensional world overflowing with angels and demons and miracles and prayers being answered, I entered into a non-enchanted, colorless, tasteless, two-dimensional world stuffed full of people, plain, ordinary, and deeply religious people. I walked around like the undead, questioning whether existing in a godless world was worth it. I remained there for three years. I discovered a few similarities between each experience. My faith in Santa Claus was based on what my mother, grandmother, and father told me, the people I loved and trusted the most. Although a few questions began to surface when I was six or seven, I didn't give them much thought until I couldn't deny them any longer. Likewise, my faith in God rested on the same foundation. Those who loved me most told me about God. I'd never done the research. I assumed that I was told truth. Neither Santa nor God became my own. I inherited both. I was grandfathered in. And now, each was being threatened. If you're unfamiliar with the classic Christmas movie, The Polar Express, here's a summary. The Polar Express tells of a boy who has reached an age when he begins to have doubts believing in Santa. Late one Christmas Eve, the young boy is lying awake, waiting for the sound of sleigh bells ringing from Santa's sleigh. Five minutes to midnight, his room begins to shake, and he hears a thunderous sound outside his window. The boy jumps from his bed and sees a train in the middle of his street. The boy grabs his robe and rushes out the front door to look at the train. The train's conductor asks the boy if he's getting aboard. The boy asks, where are you going? To the North Pole, of course. This is the Polar Express. At the last minute, the boy jumps on the train and finds other young boys and girls going to the North Pole. Their adventure begins. On the train, he meets lots of other children. Among them, a know-it-all, a clever girl, and a poor boy. When they reach the North Pole, the children meet Santa Claus, and the boy gets the very first Christmas present of the year, a sleigh bell from Santa Claus' sleigh. They return safely to their homes in time for Christmas Day, and the boy finds the Christmas present from Santa beneath his tree, after which the story concludes. So much good in this movie. But I want to focus on the heart of the movie. Hero Boy had to experience Christmas and Santa for himself. His doubts could no longer be ignored. Believing what his parents and friends told him about Santa no longer held firm. He had to see for himself. He needed to know for certain. At least he had to experience enough he could believe. Isn't it true many people sitting in churches across our nation inherited a faith, a religion, a salvation from their parents, their grandparents? It's a faith they borrowed. They, they never acquired it never possessed it. They were grandfathered in. They went to church as kids. They were told about God and David and Goliath, Daniel in the lion's den, Noah's ark, Jesus feeding the 5,000. But somewhere along the path of life, all of it began to break down. 
They began asking questions no one wanting to maintain a peaceful and stress-free faith are permitted to ask. And today, it's at best a few good stories offering grounding for morality. At worst, a bunch of fairy tales useful for weak-minded people. Isn't it true many people you know walked away from it all a few years ago? And when you think about it, you know why. Maybe it was your son, and he had this one friend who died of cancer. A good person, a loving person. And he began to ask, if there is a God, then why? Or maybe it's your daughter, and she's gay. And the church has rejected her, and many Christians have condemned her and made her feel horrible for loving someone of the same gender. To her, if Christianity is like those Christians in that church, she wants no part of it. Or maybe it's your father who just can't reconcile science and scripture together. Or maybe it's your friend who's tired of all the hypocrisy. Or maybe it's you. For a myriad of reasons, your faith is hollow. Your belief is empty. You keep the image up because you don't want to disappoint your family or friends. But the truth is, you're pretty much done with faith. And you're done with the Bible. And you're done with God. It's everywhere. It's why many adults have walked away from church. It's why many are not here today. It's not because they're lazy or they lack commitment or they're more sinful than those who happen to be in church somewhere today. For many, faith is not theirs. It was their mother's or their father's or their friend's, but it wasn't their own faith. It's why many of you struggle with Christianity. I mean, you've heard about the experience of other people, how other people encountered God, but to you, God remains abstract, an idea, a philosophy, maybe even a failed attempt. What you have is borrowed. You don't own it. You use it when it's convenient and practical, but it's not something for which you're willing to give your life. You're like Hero Boy. You want to believe. You try to believe. But the questions, the experiences, the silence of the sky makes you wonder. So how do we move from a borrowed faith to an owned faith? How do we, like Hero Boy, experience our own journey and arrive at our desired destination? I thought a lot about that this past week. And you know what? There is no formula. There's no magic prayer to pray. There's no secret uh, code that you can insert somehow spiritually and everything falls in line. It doesn't work that way. What we're talking about in this message has to be personal. Nothing will take an abstract, weak, shaky, and shallow faith and make it something able to withstand the pressures, questions, and attacks like personal knowledge. So where do we go from here? Is there any help? Is there any direction? Well, what I want to do is tell you a story from the book of Genesis. Make a few connections and suggestions and allow you to draw your own parallels and conclusions. The guy's life is outlined from Genesis 25 through Genesis 35. Ten chapters of the Bible is dedicated to this guy. His name is Jacob. And Jacob had a twin brother named Esau, but they could not have been any different. Esau was born first and favored by his father, Isaac. Within this culture, names meant a lot. The parent didn't Google cool baby names. A child's parent would choose a name reflecting a unique trait of a child or a name reflecting joy or tragedy in birth or maybe even a dream they had for their child to fulfill. So Jacob's parents named him Jacob for a reason. Jacob means he grasps the heel. Because when Jacob and Esau were born, Jacob was holding on to his brother Esau's heel. It was almost as if Jacob was trying to pull Esau back so he could get ahead. Interestingly, Jacob's behavior, even as a baby, revealed the way Jacob felt about Esau his entire life. Jacob was constantly trying to get ahead of his brother Esau which was reflected throughout Jacob's life. Jacob lied, cheated, manipulated, twisted situations for his own good. He did not care who he hurt in the process, even if the people most hurt were his brother and father. Jacob was a walking, talking, breathing contradiction. Now, I say contradiction because Jacob's heritage was one of faithfulness, honesty, integrity, godliness. 
His grandfather is Abraham, the father of Israel, one of the godliest faith-filled men to ever live. Through Abraham came the promises of God and ultimately the Messiah. That's Jacob's granddad. Jacob's father is Isaac, the promised child, the one God specifically gave to Abraham and Sarah in their old age when Sarah, Isaac's mother, was well past childbearing age. In fact, Isaac means laughter because when God told Abraham and Sarah they would have children, they laughed. Not only because Sarah's womb was beyond its prime, but so was Abraham's baby-making skills. Anyway, God intervened. And Isaac was born to Abraham and Sarah in their old age. So Jacob came from a strong spiritual heritage. No doubt he heard the stories over and over again. Jehovah, God's personal name, was revered and honored in Jacob's home. People used to say, isn't that Jacob, Abraham's grandson and Isaac's son? Faith and God and prayer and obedience and sacrifice and all the things spiritual swirled around Jacob from the time he was a child until he was a grown adult. It was like he was swimming in a sea of spiritual legacy. It would have been easy for him to simply lie back and float on the spiritual buoyancy of his family. He could simply accept it, walk his father's and grandfather's spiritual path, join them on their journey, and go wherever they led. But Jacob was different. He did not march to the drum as family. He was independent. He had wants that were different from his grandfather and dad. Jacob chose what he wanted, and he went for it no matter who he had to move or what he had to destroy in the process. And I suspect for a long time, Jacob was simply going along for the ride when it came to faith in God. His grandparents and parents set Jacob on a spiritual journey, and Jacob went along with the flow. Spiritual momentum was strong in their family. He was riding the wave of his parents' faith. He followed their God because that's what the son of Isaac and grandson of Abraham was expected to do. But at some point, Jacob needed to experience this God his ancestors experienced. He needed to have faith, and he needed to have a faith of his own. So what happened? Long story short. Because of how Jacob treated people, including his family, he made many enemies. One enemy was his own brother, Esau. Earlier, Jacob cheated and manipulated Esau, and Esau grew to hate his brother Jacob. Jacob gets word his brother Esau is looking for him. It has been years since Jacob interacted with his brother Esau, and the last time they were together, Esau vowed to kill Jacob. What does Jacob do? He begins to manipulate tries to pacify Esau with gifts, but it doesn't work. Esau has vowed to kill Jacob. Repairing the rift between Esau and Jacob through gifts is too little, too late. So Jacob must think quickly. Esau's after him. And unless something radical happens, Esau will kill Jacob. So Jacob sets up camp on the banks of the Jabbok River. He has his family with him and a small army. But before the night is over, Jacob does something bizarre. He sends everyone away across the river so he can be alone. Why? Here's what I think. Jacob is tired of running. He's exhausted. For the first time, Jacob begins to see life differently. He realizes finally everything doesn't circle around him, and he realizes he has hurt a lot of people throughout his life. And maybe, just maybe, in the quiet of the moment, he begins to wonder about this God of his grandfather and father. This God who allegedly promised his grandfather Abraham a family that would outnumber the stars and who would miraculously uh, brought his father Isaac into existence inside his grandmother's dead womb. Maybe Jacob prayed for this God to reveal himself in a personal way, to not stay hidden, but to show himself. Maybe Jacob was tired of running and knew it was the only way he was going to survive all the people he had hurt is that he would need an encounter with this God just like his grandfather and his father encountered. So alone he sits on the side of the riverbank thinking about all he did. But he doesn't realize he isn't alone. A stranger has been watching him from a distance and jumps Jacob and they begin to wrestle. After an intense battle lasting the large portion of the night, the sun begins to peek over the horizon and the stranger tells Jacob the fight is over and he needs to go. It is only then, 
Jacob realizes he is not fighting a man. He is wrestling with God himself. I know it's difficult to wrap our mind around the thought of God literally wrestling with Jacob, but the Old Testament is multi-layered in history and allegory and imagery. You have to read the words, then read in between the words. Listen very carefully. There comes a point in your life and my life when we have to get alone, away from mom and dad, away from grandparents, away from church people, away from friends, alone, just us and God, if he's there. You see, when you finally get alone, I mean really alone, that's when you'll realize you've never been alone. Have you ever wished you could look God in the eye, if he's there, and tell him what you really think of his plan for you? Tell him that you're not really happy with the way he's running his universe? Have you ever wished you could put God on the witness stand and question his wisdom? I have. And Jacob gets the chance. The battle gets intense. And at some point, God kicks Jacob in the hip and wounds him deeply. But Jacob refuses to let go. And instead of running away in agony, he holds on tightly and asks for a blessing. And God gives it to him. That's it. That's my message. You see, you and I need to come to a place in our journey of life where we stop long enough to confront God, to look him in the face, to scream into the silence if you prefer and say, I will not let you go until you reveal yourself to me. I mean, come on. If God is who he says he is, then he can certainly handle your requests, right? If God is the God of Abraham and Isaac, then he's big enough to become the God of Jacob too. And the God of Scott, and the God of Josh, and the God of Mark and Jan and Corey, and you fill in the blank, your God. So go for it. Get alone and tell him what you need. What does that look like, Scott? Well, you have to experience an encounter with God for yourself. You have to find out if the stories are true. You have to determine whether or not there is a God and what he's like. You have to refuse to go on your parents' faith or ride the coattail of your grandparents. Like Hero Boy, you have to get on the train and go yourself. You see, God has no grandchildren, only children. You have to find out yourself. You have to say it in your own way. I will not believe until I experience it for myself. I will not believe until I've investigated, probed the bottom, tested the integrity, asked the questions, pushed the boundaries. Go ahead. Get alone all by yourself and ask God to reveal himself to you. But don't be surprised if you receive an answer like, unlike anything you were expecting. Don't be surprised if you encounter a God who leaves you differently than the way he found you. And don't be surprised if you encounter a God who leaves himself differently than the way you found him. I want to give you two final passages that we're going to pray and we'll be finished with part one. Genesis 32, 30, after Jacob wrestles with God and after God kicks him in his hip and they both depart, Jacob names the place Penel. And he named it Penel because it means, I've seen God face to face. Do you see how personal that is? In the past, God was the God of his grandfather, Abraham. God was the God of his father, Isaac. Now, Jacob says, he's become my God because I've seen him face to face. The last passage of scripture is found in Genesis 50, 24. Jacob has a son by the name of Joseph. And Joseph is set to lead Egypt. And it's an incredible story, a beautiful story outlined for us in Genesis. And at the end of Joseph's life, at the very end when he is on his deathbed and his kids gather around him, listen to what J Joseph says. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. God will certainly take care of you and bring you out of this land to the land he promised to Abraham to Isaac, 
and to Jacob. God has now become Jacob's God. I challenge you, get yourself alone with God and say, God, no matter what, I want you to reveal yourself to me. Don't ride on the faith of your parents and grandparents. Take a hold of God and say, God, reveal yourself. So God can become your God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this message that challenges us to not to have a borrowed faith, not to have a faith that someone else tells us is true, but we ourselves can probe and we can test and we can push and we can ask the questions. We can do the research. We can pray the prayers. We can find out on our own. And Father, we can realize that you are alive and you are alive in our lives. It doesn't have to be something somebody else told us. We can experience you for ourselves. God, you were the God not only of Abraham and Isaac, but you were also the God of Jacob. May that be true in our own lives. Thank you for this challenge. Thank you for pushing us to the place in our life where it all becomes real and it all becomes personal. Thank you for what you're going to do in the lives of the people listening. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this video. While you're here, make sure you subscribe and turn the bell on so you don't miss any other videos or content Forest Park releases. Make sure you share this with a friend. Take a few moments and check out some other things Forest Park has.